The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. So I'm Walt Flood IV, flood testing out of Chicago. Title of the presentation, testing high-strength concrete, at least the way we've been doing it. It doesn't necessarily match up exactly with ACI, though we've been working on that. Brief outline, I'm going to give a brief history of high-strength in the Chicago area, some of the stranger things that maybe haven't really been, been published that not too many people even know happened, field testing and casting. I'm more dealing with the, the routine every day quality control on the, the high strength rather than some of the more exotic testing that happens that you've heard a little bit more about already. The laboratory testing side of it and then a little bit on the field monitoring. There's some modulus frames and then down there that's my great grandfather Walter the first who started the company in 1913. So that's him in 1913. So we've been involved in kind of the high strength, pretty much from the start, developing it with the producers in Chicago. Basic history, there was a crazy ready mix producer that thought to hire a structural engineer, Jaime Marino, that was Material Service Corporation. He'd essentially go out and spend a lot of time at ACI, at some of the structural engineer conferences, and would make good friends with some of the, the guys from SOM and Thornton Tomasetti, and, get to talking about what they needed and then would then convince them that material service could do that and then Monday morning show up at work and tell the poor guys in the QC lab that by the way in three months we have to provide 14,000 PSI concrete even though they didn't really know how to do it at the time so they didn't always enjoy getting to work on Monday to see what Jaime had promised that weekend. 1962 Outer Drive East 6,000 KSI was specified. 4,000 was pretty typical at the time. They also snuck a couple of 7,500 columns in, and they put strain gauges and instrumentum, and that was essentially their model. So they used each job to kind of build for the next, so they'd get a little bit of experience on that job, and then that would flow into the next one where that would be required. Marina City is important just because it was a slip form, which is a little unique. But the next big one was Lake Point Tower, where they took those the data from that 7,500 columns that they had done previously, along with some more trial mixes, and had 7,500 specified concrete. That same year, this is one that not too many people know, the stairs still there. I took that last year, I think, in 900 North Michigan, the Weston Michigan Avenue. That was the first use of 9,000 PSI concrete. It's an unsupported circular stair. Looks pretty nice, but that's what they needed the strength for. And it's still there. And then that's Lake Point Tower down on the right. 1972, another 7,500 spec. They snuck some 9,000 columns in. Again, instrumented them, which then flowed into Water Tower Place, which is down there on the right, where they used a 9,000 spec concrete. 1983, they had gone all the way up to 14 and really what that change was, that big jump, all of that up until say 1980 was done with no silica fume, no super. So now at say 1980, super came in and they were able to lower the water cement ratio a bunch and get a lot better. By the end of the 80s, essentially where that 17 comes in down there in 1988, that's when silica fume first, first started being used in the mixes, which gave that you know, next big jump. But field testing, I saw Jack Evans in here earlier. He's been hammering on this for a few years, but especially, at least in our area, the concrete's delivered at an eight or nine inch slump, and they want to just add a whole bunch of super. It's, it can never be wet enough. So testing slump has become nearly useless. It'll come in at a 10, and 
will be so happy because, yay, we don't have to add any super, and they'll still want to add super. So he's been a big proponent, and I'm kind of on board with him to measure flow like you would for an FCC mix, even for regular mixes, rather than slump, because then you actually get a little bit of meaning out of it instead of everything being, you know, 9 plus or what have you. But you just, you test air and temperature like normal. You really want to look for air spikes. There's so many admixtures in them. If something isn't interacting right, you'll get a big boost in air, and of course, then your strength is gone. Using 4 by 8s both from a curing as well as transportation and then just capacity of the compression machines. Um, you start getting into the, the bigger numbers, 18,000 PSI, it's kind of hard to break a, a 6 by 12, and when it goes, it's like a large bomb going off. Definitely recommend the, the 4 by 8 route. Low 10,000 PSI, we kind of treat everything like a 4,000 mix. It's not too big a deal. Once you get to 10,000, then you start doing things a little bit differently. You extend that initial cure instead of going from 24 to 48 hours on site. You extend it to at least 48, say 40, pick up the second day, or even 72 hours. Everything goes immediately into a water bath instead of sitting out. The temperature limit is a lot tighter. Also... You've got to prepare the ends anyway, so you leave the end exposed. It minimizes the variability a whole bunch using the water bath rather than just a standard, you know, cure box even. And then also we're consolidating with a vibrator. Again, partly because the mixes are so flowable and they have a tendency to sometimes segregate, and they're so sticky too. Compressive strength, everything comes down to end preparation. Otherwise, there really isn't a whole lot different. ASTM limits pad and cap usage to below 7,000 unless you do some, some qualification testing in the lab, which takes a little bit more work, but no pads at all are allowed over 12,000, um, and that's just dictated by ASTM, so you have to grind. There's our grinder. Part of the problem is that, at least in our area, the ready mix producers seem to be just giving away cement because almost everything is going over 12. I mean, this was from last week, I looked, and it's an 8,000 specified mix, and if you look at 56 days there, it's over 12. Now, to properly break that, technically, you've got to grind it. There is an out in the ASTM standard that says making the decision for the pads is based on the specified strength, so technically you don't have to, but does that mean your break is kind of no good? I mean, I guess you could make the argument that if you're over the specified strength, it doesn't matter. But I don't know, being a testing guy, an engineer, I kind of want the right number. So I don't know, that might be something to take up at ASTM. So we mounted a GoPro inside the chamber of the compression machine and, and took a couple of videos and slowed it down a whole bunch. And this one I thought was kind of cool. If you look kind of in this area, I, I believe. Before the cylinder fails, you'll see a couple of little pops where little pieces will pop out, and then it's a few tenths of a second later where the cylinder kind of bulges and then fails completely. It's pretty cool. So yeah. Nothing much left. You, the bottom plates, which are, you know, a good 10 pounds each, are going all over the place. And Let's see. See if we can catch that that small little fracture up. It's up at the top on this one, but yeah. Modulus elasticity. A lot of the higher performance jobs, the the higher buildings now are going to a modulus requirement. They technically have a strength requirement as well, but most of the time it's the modulus requirement that's kind of controlling. For an example, you might have a 12,000 PSI at 56 day mix requirement, but you'll have a 6.6 .6 million modulus requirement. So usually in order to make sure you hit that 6.6 .6 and not be the average, but at least meet it, uh, you end up supplying say 14,000 PSI concrete. You need three cylinders because for modulus testing you have to break the first one to know what the strength of the set is because you then test for the modulus up to 40% of that value. So you, you might need a few extra cylinders in order to, to get your full set. You do then end up breaking those cylinders after the modulus testing, so it's not like they're, they're used exclusively for modulus, though. There's a modulus frame with 
digital X sensometer on it. That's the output direct from, from our machine anyway. Most are pretty similar. This was a 10,000 result. I think it was a 10,000 mix. Let's see, it's just over 6 million there on the modulus. But modulus elasticity, according to 318, 363, Jim Cook and Fred Meyer did quite a bit of work to develop some curves. They can give very different results. So for example, if you assume 150 pounds per cubic foot density with 12,000 PSI mix, each of those equations will give 6.6 .6 million, 5.6 million, or 6.7 million modulus. So if you are actually needing to use the modulus for a design, it's really important that you actually measure it rather than assume one of these equations. As we heard, it's, it's mostly dependent on your course aggregate. So you might have a course aggregate that'll hit 17,000, but there was actually a building in, in Atlanta where they were using 12,000 PSI, 15,000 PSI concrete that they were achieving and needed a 6 million modulus. And they actually went and took some cores out of the columns and saw that they only had a 3.7, which is you know on par with what you'd get out of lightweight. And they just had never tested that that aggregate source and that mix ahead of time, which took, they had to install a whole bunch of cross bracing to, to eat up all the shear that the columns were no longer able to, to support. Luckily, they took the cores and found that out. One of Jaime's articles in 1990 talked specifically about that. The 318 equation actually overshoots, over predicts modulus for high strength. Committee 363, that's why they came out with their version, but that might even go the other way or like in Atlanta, still overshoot, depending on your particle packing and the specific aggregate you have. Jim did a, a whole bunch of data in Texas. He did this analysis for Florida Department of Transportation. They were noticing all their bridges had big lumps in them. It was because they were actually under predicting the modulus. So they made all their bridges really stiff and kind of put extra camber in them to, to account for that. And because they were stiffer than actually designed, they didn't sink as much as they thought, so everything had a hump in it. So you can go, depending on what you're using it for, it could be good or bad. Also, the development of the modulus seems to lead the strength. So, for example, the ACI equation uses, say, normally for 57,000 for the calculation of your modulus, and that's that top dotted line there on the right curve. So at the beginning, at ages of one and two days and three days, it's closer to about 70,000. Once you get out closer to 56, that it might actually be closer to, say, 50,000. A little bit on field monitoring. For most of these high buildings, and especially with the high-strength concrete, that early-age strength is still critical. And really, the, the cushy standard curing cylinders that you have aren't at all representing what's actually in place. Relying on them is probably a, a dangerous idea. But it's really useful to be able to jump those forms as fast as possible. Uh, there's one contractor that's actually using a high-strength mix in the decks to avoid having to puddle or mushroom around the columns, around the high-strength columns. So if they're within 15% of the column strength, they don't have to use two mixes on their deck. They, they can get it out much faster. It's much easier to just use one mix. So they've got essentially a 10,000-pound deck mix, and you still need to hit, hit your targets for tendon stressing and so the best way to do that is embed sensors and use maturity monitoring to be able to optimize that and actually have numbers that, that reflect what's really in place rather than relying on a cylinder that might get jostled around or most likely will not see the same curing that the actual slab or columns do. So in conclusion, high strength takes a little bit more up front, especially in the, the mix side. Think about it before it's time to, to put it in. A little bit more on the, the QC end as far as equipment. The grinders are not inexpensive. There's one rumored building that we're working on now that might have an 8 million modulus requirement, so hopefully we can get some results on that and have another interesting presentation soon.